Is New Orleans Saints defensive end Cam Jordan making a Hall of Fame case for himself? Will Saints defensive coordinator Dennis Allen get some phone calls for some head coaching opportunities this offseason? And the individual performances that made up a phenomenal defensive showing up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into this Takeaway Tuesday and Analytics Tuesday episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks as always for making this show your first listen of the day. Don't forget we are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson, NOLA on Twitter, Canal Street Chronicles, Locked on NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. And on today's episode, we'll do like we do every Tuesday, the three biggest takeaways from this past game, the big win for the New Orleans Saints that I mentioned It was a shutout. The New Orleans Saints knocking off the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hey, quickly, quickly for me, raise your hand if you lost to both Trevor Simeon and Taysom Hill this season. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, Tom, thanks for watching, man. Thanks so much for being here. All right, let's go ahead and dive into today's episode. We're having a little bit of fun. Um, Listen, I want to talk a little bit about Cam Jordan here because I think Cam Jordan, in my opinion, is making a Hall of Fame case for himself once he decides to call it quits from the NFL. As we all know, Cam Jordan eclipsed the 100 career sack mark this past Sunday up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, going up with two sacks in that game, now at 100.5, 100 and a half sacks uh, on his career so far. He's one of 38 players in NFL history to hit that mark. That's huge. We're going to come back to that number here in a little bit, but I want to get into a couple of other numbers. If we take a look at what Cam Jordan has left to do for the rest of the season, if he ends up with one and a half more sacks this season, then he'll end up with 10 straight seasons in which he's had at least seven and a half sacks. That's 10 straight, 10 in a row. Only seven other players in NFL history have ever done that. Listen to these names. The other seven players that have 10 Straight seasons, at least 10 straight seasons with at least seven and a half sacks are Reggie White, John Randall, Jared Allen, Richard Dent, Harvey Martin, Lawrence Taylor, and Derek Thomas. That's an incredible seven player list to be associated with. One and a half sacks more this season, Cam Jordan's name will be added to that very short and very impressive list. Now, keep in mind, out of those seven names, Five of those players are already Hall of Famers. And Jared Allen, who's one of the two, along with Harvey Martin, that aren't currently Hall of Famers, he's a semifinalist this year. He was just named a semifinalist in November. So that's a pretty darn good list to be a part of if you're Cam Jordan. Add into that as well what Cam Jordan has done in terms of the, you know, the 10 straight seasons with double digit tackles for a loss, the 10 straight seasons with double digit quarterback hits as well, consistent pressures playing deep into his seasons the way that he has and being so efficient and having the longevity that he's had over the course of his career. I know a lot of folks were down on him in terms of what he was producing so far this season, but right now, through 13 games, he's produced the same number of pressures that he did back last year in 16 games. So he's actually probably going to end up performing better than his 2020 numbers, which is a good a good place to be, right? So we'll see how he's able to close out the season, but he could join that very exclusive list. Now, as for the exclusive list that he's already joined, because let's not pretend like 38 names is a long list of players relative to the number of players that have played defensive end or defense at all in the NFL. I mean, being the 38th player in NFL history to eclipse 100 sacks is still really impressive. But let's break that list down a little bit. That list of 38 includes 13 present Hall of Famers. 12 that are currently not eligible or about to be eligible in 2022, and five of those players are currently active as well. J.J. Watt, Justin Houston, those those guys. Uh, Of course, Von Miller as well. Um, And so you look at this list of players, 
in terms of those that have already become Hall of Famers. And then you also have three players that are current semifinalists that are about to potentially become Hall of Famers. As we mentioned, Jared Allen is on that list, but also on that list is Robert Mathis and Demarcus Ware. Again, great company to be a part of. So of the active players right now, which includes the players that we mentioned before, along with Chandler Jones, of the active players right now, when you think about maybe one of the most, kind of the biggest shoe in in terms of active players right now that have over 100 sacks, you probably think J.J. Watt. You might think Von Miller, which of course would make a lot of sense too, but a lot of folks will think J.J. Watt because he had you know these really huge seasons, in particular four seasons in a row where he was just absolutely dominant, two 20-plus seasons followed up by a 17-plus sack season. He also had a 16-sack season later on in his career as well. But J.J. Watt right now, despite all of that, has only one and a half more sacks than Cam Jordan. He sits right now at 102, while Cam is at 100.5, right? So just a half, a, a sack and a half behind J.J. Watt, who is, to a lot of people, a shoe in to be a Hall of Famer, myself included, right? And I wouldn't erase J.J. Watt from that list at all, but I just think that you look at the players that are around Cam Jordan in terms of what he's done so far in his career, you can get an idea of how it is that Cam Jordan could get into the Hall of Fame and how he is making his Hall of Fame case. Now, does Cam Jordan have a J.J. Watt-esque career? No, he doesn't have the end-of-year awards. He doesn't have the all-pro nominations. He doesn't have the big 20-sack season, stuff like that. But he has had a more consistent and a more sustainable career as opposed to J.J. Watt, who has had zero sack seasons because of injuries, right? Cam Jordan's trajectory to me is a lot like Jared Allen's, right? If you were going to compare him to anybody that either is in the Hall of Fame or could potentially soon be in the Hall of Fame in Jared Allen's case, that comparison makes a lot of sense to me. You have Cam Jordan, who has over 100 sacks, who has over, you know, who has 200 quarterback hits in his career, who has over 100 um, tackles for a loss as well in his career. And those numbers just continuously pile up. And the only thing that gets in his way, right? What is the thing that gets in his way and it p- could potentially keep him from getting to the Hall of Fame? It's the end, lack of in, in, end of year awards. He has none of them. And by end of year awards, I mean, you know, defensive player of the year, comeback player of the year, year those types of, uh, of awards. And he he does have the uh, Hall of Fame 2010s team, but in terms of individual end of year awards, he doesn't have any. And he only has one All Pro nomination, believe it or not, right? He's only been selected to first team All Pro once in his career. Now he's been selected to second team, but the for whatever reason, first team All Pro is the only one that we count. It's not like the NBA where they count first, second, third team All NBA, right? So for whatever reason, only the first team All Pros matter, not the second teams, which doesn't make any sense. But anyway, there's still time, right? In Cam Jordan's career, he cracked a joke on Sunday night when he was talking with uh, you know the sideline reporters and everything for Sunday Night Football over at NBC, and you know he made a joke about potentially retiring at the age you know when I'm 36 and retired was the sentence, right? Which I don't think was him. I think that was just him like talking off the cuff. I don't think that was him like committing to anything or announcing anything. But he's also only 32 years old. So if he were to retire at 36, you've got another three, four years that he could potentially end up continuing to bolster these numbers. And as long as he's raising the sack numbers, as long as he's raising the tackle uh, tackle for loss numbers, the QB hit numbers, all those things, even if he's not getting the end of year awards, it's going to be harder and harder to tell Cam no by the time that he becomes eligible a few years after he does end up retiring. Plus, I know that maybe the Hall of Fame folks don't really take this into consideration, but the impact that he's had on his community and the fact that he has changed the lives of the people in the community that he now calls home, pretty Hall of Fame worthy to me. But hey, Cam Jordan's not the only New Orleans Saint setting himself up for some future success. So too is defensive coordinator Dennis Allen, who just notched himself another credit on the resume with a win over Tom Brady as interim head coach. So will he be getting some head coaching calls this offseason or will they come sooner? We've got that and much more coming up for you as we continue on today's episode of Locked On Saints. But before we get to that, I do want to tell you about our friends over at Boost Mobile. Now you listen to podcasts like this so you can get the inside track, but you switch to Boost Mobile so that you can get the power of saving 
money. And that, of course, is a major, major power. Because with Boost, you can get the power of a free 5G phone so that you can listen to all of your favorite episodes, all the latest episodes, and get the latest on your favorite teams as well as players. And with the power of three unlimited data plans that are only 30 bucks a month, you and your family can share all of those insights as well. And the power of one of the largest 5G networks so that you can do it all at the speed of 5G. So with all that money that you'll save and all of that knowledge that you'll gain, just how powerful will you become? Find out by switching to Boost Mobile today and get a free Samsung Galaxy A32 5G when you switch to one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save Boost Mobile. Free phone is limited to new customers and only one per line. Additional restrictions do apply. Offer and coverage not available everywhere or for all phones and networks. See BoostMobile.com for details. Just two more games until we wrap up week 15 of the NFL season. You know what that means. Super Bowl 56, less than 100 days away. SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. There's only one way that I would recommend you getting there and checking it out, and it's with our friends over at On Location, the official hospitality partner of the NFL, so you know they're the real deal. They are going to make sure that you get that once-in-a-lifetime ticket and experience package. You get to select the exact seats that you're going to sit in, and you get to pick from a bunch of different elite experiences as well, including an exclusive pre-game celebration with NFL legends, five-star LA hotels, and food by the great Wolfgang Puck. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 for more information or search Super Bowl on location. Once again, that's onlocationexp.com slash SB56 or search Super Bowl on location. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks again for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. Continuing on, I want to talk a little bit about Dennis Allen. Is Dennis Allen going to be getting some head coaching conversations, some head coaching inquiries over the course of the offseason? Well, the truth is that thanks to a recent rule change in the NFL, Dennis Allen may be getting those calls sooner rather than later. Now, listen, I know this is a topic that a lot of folks don't want anybody to talk about because they think that Dennis Allen is some, you know, best kept secret or something like that. And just, you know, he's not. He's not. Like Dennis Allen was very likely going to get some head coaching buzz this offseason regardless of the fact that he, you know, stood in as the interim head coach on a Sunday night national football game and, you know, blanked to the Super Bowl champions and Tom Brady. Now, did that help? <laughs> yes, massively, right? If he's interested in a head coaching position, one very likely will open up that he'll be able to step into this offseason. However, he was already on the radar for many teams, and he has been. Remember, he's been getting interviews and conversations and phone calls and everything probably over the last few offseasons, particularly with what he's done with the New Orleans Saints defense, right? Remember, he took over in 2015. Terrible year for the New Orleans Saints defense. 2016, not much better. But then all of a sudden, once he started to get his personnel in and started to build the players, started to build the the, the defensive scheme and, 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 and the personnel around what it is that he wanted to do. Wow, I worked really hard to get that out. I hope you appreciated that. Um, then all of a sudden in 2017, when his personnel started to come through and he was able to build things the way that he really wanted them to, then all of a sudden this New Orleans Saints defense, not that much of a laughing stock anymore, right? Historically bad 2014, 15, 16. Then all of a sudden they've just gotten better and better every year since 2017. So Dennis Allen has already been on the radar of many, but with that big win up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on Sunday Night Football, up against Tom Brady in such a high-profile game and such a high-profile moment, right, with Sean Payton not being available, the COVID link to all of this as well, like, this drew a lot of eyes and drew a lot of attention, and Dennis Allen stood up and had a phenomenal, phenomenal game out there. So let's talk a little bit about what this means for Dennis Allen, and we'll also talk a little bit about what it means for the New Orleans Saints. So yes, he raised his profile quite a bit with that big resume building win in Tampa. Let's talk about the NFL rule change that also makes it so that you might not have to wait until the offseason if you want to get in touch with Dennis Allen. So the uh, NFL recently made a rule change literally like last week in which the, uh, the NFL teams can now, and this is them trying something new, the NFL teams can now begin to reach out to head coaching candidates in the final two weeks of the NFL season, week 17 week 18. So that would mean right after that Miami Dolphins game, and then you get into the week 17 conversation before the Carolina Panthers game, 
Dennis Allen could start getting some phone calls and in fact, could even start getting some interviews during those two weeks. So that makes you a little bit nervous, right? Most defensive coordinators, most play, most head coaches that are going to be getting those phone calls or potential head coaches that are going to get those phone calls during the last two weeks of the season might say, hey, not right now. Let's regroup and, and, and talk over the offseason. I need to focus on what I'm doing right now. But some folks might leap to that and others that aren't currently employed in the NFL might potentially leap for that as well. So just something to keep an eye out on that Dennis Allen might not have to wait if he doesn't want to. Like he can start having these conversations as soon as after the Miami Dolphins game. So who are the coaches or excuse me, who are the teams that could potentially reach out to Dennis Allen to try to pull him over to their spot? Well, we just watched two of them on Monday Night Football. There's, uh, listen, I don't know what the Chicago Bears are going to do about Matt Nagy, but I'm going to say this. If the Chicago Bears fired Matt Nagy, I wouldn't be surprised. Chicago Bears, one of two NFL franchises that have never fired a head coach during the regular season. This rule change could potentially change that for the Chicago Bears. It's only the Bears and the Baltimore Ravens, by the way. The Ravens have only been around since, what, 96 or something like that. And then, you know, they've also been very successful as well. So they haven't been around nearly as long as Chicago Bears, who have been around since the beginning of time. And so because of that, the Chicago Bears streak is actually really, really impressive. So will they change their entire history? to get an early start on potentially finding another head coach? Who knows? Because the trick here is that in order for you to take advantage of this last two weeks of the NFL season, you can start contacting and interviewing candidates thing is that either you have to have already moved on from your head coach or that current head coach has to be sort of notified that his time is coming to an end, right? That he's going to be let go or relieved of his duties at the end of the season, sort of like what LSU did with Coach O. Now, that's one team. The other team that we watched on Monday night, the Minnesota Vikings. If they decide to move on from uh, Mike Zimmer, then all of a sudden Dennis Allen becomes a really, really enticing prospect for them because he's a defensive coach. It's what they're comfortable with, and he could slide right in there. Another place that he already has some history with would be the Las Vegas Raiders. Now, the Raiders reunited with the coach here recently. That didn't go well at all, not one bit. And so I don't know if maybe that's going to make them a little bit more skittish about the idea of potentially reuniting with a guy like Dennis Allen, who is eight and 28 as their head coach in the three, well, two two seasons and four games that he was their their head coach. But those would be the three teams right now that I can think of that would potentially come out and say, hey, Dennis Allen is somebody that we're very, very interested with. I could see maybe the Jacksonville Jaguars potentially getting in that mix, but I think Byron left, which makes a lot of sense for them, or at least some offensive head coach that's going to allow them to really maximize what it is that they're trying to build around Trevor Lawrence. They have their franchise quarterback now. They're not a very defensively talented team, or or they are a pretty defensively talented team, but they're not a very offensively talented team. They need to raise some of that talent there. So I could see them going with an offensive head coach, offensive minded head coach there. And we'll see what happens in other places. The New York Giants, for instance, do they stick with Joe Judge? Do they move on from Joe Judge? What happens in a couple of other, you know, spaces? What's where's the where's the sort of surprise coach firing or or, or retirement or something like that that could happen across the NFL? Those spots, of course, could potentially open up. But those three, the Minnesota Vikings, the Las Vegas Raiders, and the Chicago Bears, those are the three potential spots that make the most sense to challenge the New Orleans Saints, potentially take him away from New Orleans. And let me be very clear. I hope that New Orleans is able to do everything that they can to hold on to Dennis Allen and convince him to stay because they won't be able to block him. If he's getting a promotion, they can't block him. If he's making a lateral move, they could step in and say, nah, fam, that's not happening. But Otherwise, they would just have to be able to convince Dennis Allen to stay. And it's going to be a little bit tough. It was going to be tough before, but after that showing on Sunday Night Football, the high profile, the way that he stood up and the way that he that that team performed around him, I think it's just got a little bit more challenging, to say the least, for the New Orleans Saints to retain him. And you know what? Dennis Allen deserves whatever it is that he can get. If he can get that head coaching opportunity, rumble, young man, rumble. Go for it. All right, coming up next, we're going to dive into that Saints defense that was phenomenal and take a look at some of the individual performances that made it up. It wasn't just about what they did to Tom Brady. It was also about what they did on an individual level. We're going to highlight some of those defensive players as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. And as we wrap up, I want to tell you about our friends over at betonline.ag. If you are the betting type, there's two football games tonight that you can get in on, and they both have some pretty wide spreads right now. Both of these games moved from Sunday. You got the Seattle Seahawks going up against the Los Angeles Rams, the Rams at home favored by seven points. You've got the Philadelphia Eagles hosting the Washington football team. 
Philadelphia at home, favored by six and a half points. If you want to get in on those spreads or the over unders, you might want to go under on some of these, honestly, particularly that NFC East matchup. This is absolutely the place that you should go. It's betonline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to get in on all of that action. So go ahead, check out the website, betonline.ag. And if it's your first time visiting the site, don't forget to use the promo code locked on, L O C K E D O N, for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on, L O C K E D O N, over at Bet Online, where the game starts. Let's get it. Huda Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints. It's our takeaway Tuesday and our analytics Tuesday. I haven't gotten too far into the analytics, but we about to. We about to drop those now because the big takeaway here is that the New Orleans Saints defense was phenomenal and it was made up of a bunch of individual performances. We kind of highlighted what the New Orleans Saints did, you know, well against Tampa Bay, right? The pass rush, the coverage was great. The the you know, pass rushing scheme was really unique and they let a whole bunch of new things fly on the Saints defense that worked really well. But I want to talk about some of the individual performances, but a couple of other sort of like big team things that I want to highlight first. No red zone snaps allowed by this Saints defense at all. Not a single red zone possession for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's remarkably impressive. The other thing that I want to talk about is EPA, right? So expected points per play, basically how efficient is an offense or how inefficient does a defense make an offense? So the ways that you're looking at that. New Orleans Saints consistently in the top five over the course of the season. Here's another thing that works in Dennis Allen's favor, especially if they're analytics heavy, like the Minnesota Vikings are getting more and more analytics focused. Um, Top five in terms of drop back EPA, number one in the NFL this season when it comes to rush EPA. Uh, You've got a top five EPA per play combined there. And you also have, let me make sure I read my notes correctly, the lowest success rate allowed when it comes to all opponent offenses. <laughs> I mean, they have been absolutely remarkable here, but it's the individual performances that help to make this up. Um, the secondary is where I want to start because they played extremely well in this one. Marshall Lattimore allowed only a 50% catch percentage, four catches on eight targets for 39 yards, only four yards after catch. When I tell you that this defense was all about tackling at the catch point in this game, it is absolutely evident. He also had two pass breakups. So out of the four incompletions that were there, at least two of them he forced, right? It wasn't just overthrows or drops or throwaways, anything like that, that kind of went in that that player's direction. No, he forced those incompletions. A 64.1 pass rating when targeted. And oh yeah, he also added four tackles and two run stops as well, because again, he can tackle, right? So you saw him get involved immediately at the catch point, but you also saw him step up in the run game. Uh, CJ Gardner Johnson, a lot of folks are making a big deal about CJ, GJ, CD Deuce because of the, you know, the mean mugging and getting up in Tom Brady's face. But let's not forget how well he played. Second quarter or first quarter, fantastic as a, as a run support guy. Second quarter, he had that big uh, stop on the screen pass when he fought through a block to make a tackle. And then in the second half, you saw him walk away with the interception as well and get into some of that trash talk. He told Mike Neighbors, who wrote uh, that book, by the way, Breeze the Breezeway, which I can't wait to read, um, that he basically told Tom Brady, I'm not afraid of you right now, right? Ain't, we're not afraid of you. And that that's that's the type of attitude that you get with CJ Garner Johnson and this New Orleans Saints defense who simply fear no offense and fear no players. CJ, uh, five target, five catches on nine targets, 55 yards allowed. No touchdowns, of course, were scored in this game because I don't know if you remember or not, but the Saints shut them out. They scored zero points. Just want to make sure that that was clear. Uh, He had one interception, of course, 32.9 passer rating when targeted. And then he just, you know, went on to casually add seven total tackles and three run stops as well. Paul Sinadiba also had a nice day, targeted twice, no catches allowed, one pass breakup, 39.6 passer rating when targeted. So this New Orleans Saints starting cornerback trio has been absolutely fantastic over the course of these last few games. So great to have CJ Garner Johnson back in that mix. But they didn't do it all alone, right? They did it with the pass rush as well. So I just want to highlight the pass rush here. 19 total pressures in this one. 16 of them came combined from just Cam Jordan, Marcus Davenport, and David Onyemata. David Onyemata on his own, seven pressures in this game, including a sack. That's the David Onyemata that you've been waiting to see all season and such a welcome sight to see it. And of course, you love to see it up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, in you know such a huge game in this one where you needed the defense to win. You also had five, um, five pressures by Marcus Davenport on his own and four of those 
from Cam Jordan, who had two sacks. Marcus Davenport, of course, had a sack as well. So this New Orleans Saints defense was just playing out of its mind. Marcus Davenport, by the way, the third highest graded edge defender in the NFL, according to Pro Football Focus. I mean, look, this New Orleans Saints defense is exactly as advertised, whether you look at them as a group or whether you look at them individually. I don't want to go without mentioning Demario Davis and Quan Alexander. They both also played well. A lot of what they did will come up in, in, in film study because a lot of what they did was taking away options over the middle of the field. They were so, so efficient at controlling the middle of the field, along with Malcolm Jenkins, who played a lot of those robber roles over the middle a few times as well. I mean, those three guys really, really managed to take away what it is that the Saints usually end up getting thrashed in, right? That area, that middle area of the field. And then Marcus Williams continues to take things away deep. If this Saints defense can continue to get even healthier, get Peyton Turner back, get Tono Passanio back so that you can rotate these defensive ends in and out of these um, these NASCAR packages, these three defensive end sets, get Tono Passanio, who has that versatility, can play inside and outside, then I just, I don't know how you compete with this defense if they can stay healthy throughout the rest of the season, especially if they get healthier and then stay healthy. So the lines, right? The offensive line, the defensive line, that's where you're looking for this New Orleans Saints team to get healthier here as they get closer and closer to this game up against the Miami Dolphins on Monday. Remember, that game's not until Monday, so you're going to get a later set of injury reports and all. So don't expect that on Wednesday, expect that on Thursday. But of course, whenever and whatever we get, we'll keep you up to date here as we get ready for this matchup up against the Miami Dolphins. But we're not going to turn the page on this win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just yet. We've got Film Watch Wednesday tomorrow. We're going to talk a little bit more about the things that don't show up in the analytics, the things that don't show up on the stat sheet, right? Demario Davis, Quan Alexander, Malcolm Jenkins, those guys who took away so much over the middle of the field. Marcus Williams, who took away so much deep in the field. What were those stunts and twists that were being run on the defensive line? Why were they so impactful? We'll look at and try to answer all of those questions for you in tomorrow's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks as always, y'all, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. Don't forget to Make your second listen of the day. Our good friends over at Locked On Bets. Go and win yourselves some money with your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. And as always, y'all, for everything in between these episodes, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.